the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance, talking about selecting a new king. Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's the second time that he's made this reference. Uh, look up at the t at, towards the top of your paper in uh, 1 Samuel 13, 14, when he was Samuel, when the, the Samuel was talking about a new king, he says, the Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And that's when he told Saul he was in, he was in trouble with the Lord for not paying attention to the details, remember, of the directive will. So now it's come down to, now he is actually going through the, the sons of Jesse, isn't he? Remember, he went through, going through the seven sons, and he says, and he goes through all seven of them, and, and he can't find them. But what's interesting, the first son that came out, he looked at him, and he did gauge it by physical appearance. Then he remembers, hey, the Lord says, uh, in verse 70, the Lord comes back and reminds him, uh, I, don't, I don't look the way we look at people. I don't evaluate them the way we do. So um, this, this got tagged with David. I mean, there's a line connected to King David, a man after God's own heart, right? I mean, it's, I mean, probably a lot of sermons have been preached over that thing because it was one of those um, one of those tags that was given to King David um, and a, a good one because it wasn't man that gave him that tag was it it was the Lord the Lord that gave him that one and uh, boy I tell you and the Lord has to see as man doesn't to know that because David got himself in a lot of trouble and and, and always came back with the Lord. He didn't stay out there. You know, it's one thing to get in trouble. You know, one thing to get into sin and carnality. It's another thing to get back in with the Lord, isn't it? Don't stay out there in, in uh, no man's land. Get back. And David was one of those guys to get away. He came back. And eventually, he stuck with it. Um, eventually, he'll grow up. You know, eventually, if you'll just stick with the Word of God, you'll, you'll grow through this stuff in your life. You know, there's just stuff you've got to weed through. Uh, we're, we're a good ground because we're interested in the Word of God, but there are a lot of weeds in there. <laughs> so you've got to do a lot of hoeing, you know, uh, cultivating uh, to get that really to be a great producing place. And, and it will come to pass. The, God measures it as a good ground. And... Uh, and he's after production from it. And, and he's, he's wonderfully patient. <laughs> he's wonderfully patient. And listen, one of the ways you know that you've reached super grace status is you've become wonderfully patient. You didn't. And, and, and I'll tell you who'll be shocked. It will be you. Because it's so not like you. And, and that's just one of many signs, but that's one of them. So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to come in and take a look at a believer after God's heart. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest, those who are visiting with us by the Internet. We expect this from you as well. Uh, it's classroom etiquette. You can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin needs to be confessed. It could be mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins, but they have to be confessed in silence and privacy before you open the scriptures and get into it because it's a spiritual book for spiritual people, and God gave us the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach it to us with clarity and enlightenment to our life. Why? Because the truth of the word of God sets us free from improper thinking. And by that I mean it stays consistent with the word with the word and the will of God. 
So First John 1, 9 says, if, you're, if there's evidence of personal sin in your life, what should I do? He says, well, then you confess it. Because the propitious work of Christ works to the, from the cross to your life through confession of your sin. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. So that cleansing is very important, not for salvation for us as believers, but rather for sanctification and spirituality. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way. We pray for those who are not with us that are traveling around the mission field or doing things the Lord has purposed in their heart to do tonight other than here because of ministry orientation. And for tonight, Father, we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of how God views a believer after his own heart. And uh, we pray that when the Father looks within our heart, he would see that heart, a heart that pleases him and not just ourselves. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is during the reign of King Saul that this tag was given about a believer after God's own heart. And it winds up tagged with David. And, uh, but in it, it tells us what God is looking for in a believer's life. And it is your interest in his heart, the desires of his heart. Well, who is a man that God, a man after God's own heart? Well, it's a, God, it's a man or a woman who is after God's own heart. <laughs> who, uh, who desires, and listen, isn't that true with people that capture our heart? People who capture our heart, we have a desire uh, to please them. We have a desire to, to be that person. So, and so we learn a principle that God does not look at man the way man looks at man necessarily or the w way the world does, but rather he uh, looks at his heart and he's looking for somebody whose heart beats one with his. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus' idea. Uh, Paul picked this up in Acts 13. This is interesting. I wrote it on your paper. Paul, talking about David, caught this idea. And he, he remarks, after he had removed him, Saul, he raised up David to be the king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart. Watch this now. Who will do my will? See, that's, that's what he's after. Who will do my will? It, he, and, and listen, he required it even of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus says to him in the garden, not my will, but thy will be done. Um. And then there's, and then Paul gives a footnote to that concept, a man after my own heart will do my will. From, he says in verse 23, from the offspring of this man, according to divine promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. That's a, that's a phenomenal thing. He, he's carried this same idea that from David, from the covenant with David all the way to the coming of Christ, from the covenant of David to the coming of Christ, this principle has borne out. God is looking for believers uh, of, that have a desire for his heart. So it is interesting to us, picking up this idea through Paul, it is interesting to us that the Lord measures a believer by the content and character of divine viewpoint based on the word of God that is working in him or her's life. So that's the point I want to make with you tonight is that concept. God is still after that man and woman believer uh, for that same reason. In 1 Peter 3, 4, Peter remarks on this. 
He says, let it be the hidden person of the heart. Call that concept the inner man. Let it be the hidden person of the heart. Now watch how, it's, how, how this works. With the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of the Lord. See, he's looking for content and character. You know, you can be superficial. Outwardly, you can be this person. Inwardly, you know, outwardly don't, don't, don't carry the load, does it? Right? I mean, once you, the doors are shut and you're behind the scene, you go like, oh, my goodness. Right? Because you spent so much time paying attention to the outward and not the inward. But listen, the truth of the matter, you have to live with the inward, not the outward. You know, I tell kids that because th that's all they live in is the outward. I tell them, boy, you, you need to, you know, the, some guy will come in and sweep a young lady off her feet. And three months, four months later, they're married. And three years later, they're divorced. Because the guy she dated wasn't the guy she married. It happened to my mother, and she was up in age when she did it. She was up in age. Careful now. <laughs> she was 40. But she was still up, up in that age. I didn't ever think she would get married. I mean, I pretty much wrote that thing off. She could never find anybody to suit her first love. First loves are hard to get rid of. You know that, don't you? They were really hard to get rid of. And listen. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. You should embrace what you had and look for it. You shouldn't get rid of it. You shouldn't get rid of it if, if it was healthy. But anyhow, that's not my subject. What the, what the soul is to the body, the heart is to the soul. And that's important. That, that principle, as simple as it is, is right on the money. Now, the heart's an interesting concept because we use it in everyday language and don't pay attention to it. Now, I'm a farmer and raised a lot of watermelon because we just liked them and my grandmother would can them and do funny stuff with them, okay? Because we wanted watermelon after the season was over and so they used the the rinds and everything and made all kinds of the jams and you name it. We, you know, the middle of a watermelon is called, it's called the heart. That's the valuable part of it. And if you raise a lot of them, what you do is you just break them open, reach in there and grab the heart out and throw the rest into the field to go back to the, whatever eats them in the field later, or it goes back to the ground, doesn't it? But we, that's called the heart. And we, we, we dealt with the heart of a lot of products. You know, that's how we referred to them. Because that's that inner core. It's the inner core of something. Uh, the heart of, a, of a, a kernel of corn. We, we referred to things like that for what it produced. So... Heart's an interesting word, and usually they're all in line with the same concept. It's the core. You're after the core of something. And so that's true here. And so what the soul is to the body, the heart is to the soul. And that's very important. I've got three points that I want to deal with you on this, with this concept. Uh, first, God created the human soul with five years. Uh, there may be more, but if you could just get these five, we'd all be happy. <laughs> okay? So I'm, and so there, there's self-consciousness. I wrote them on your paper. There's self-consciousness. And you can really see that if you have little children. Now, you may not see it as well until you have grandchildren where you're divorced from uh, subjectivity, so much subjective training, and you get into objectivity, 
but you can see, you can see the principle of self-consciousness. Self-consciousness, uh, there are three points to it that are really important. Now, there are a lot more than this, but there are three points that you can, you can, be, you can see self-consciousness uh, self and awareness. First is self. The first thing a child recognizes is himself, and he explores himself. You know, he, you know, he plays with his toes, and, and how they do this, I don't know, but they, they can take a foot and put it in their mouth. Um, and it's amazing to me, four years later, they can't do that. Five years later, they can't do that. But that first year, first or second year old can pretty much do that and can do it just any time they want to do it. Uh, that's becoming aware of oneself. And the second thing they become aware of, you can tell in their vocabulary, it's mama, daddy, other people in the family. Um, and they, they name other kids no matter what their name is. Uh, this is Bubba or whoever, you know. Depends on how the little one uh, identifies her brother or, or other siblings. So the second one is they identify the people that are caregivers. They identify people. And listen, we wind up with names they call us. Um, now, I made all of them call me sir. Uh, so I, I, I got out of that. But... If they, if they can't pronounce a, a name right, then you wind up with it. You wind up with nannies and mammies. I, all the kids call my wife mammy, and they still do. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and then, and so it's, it's self, number one, and then others that are connected with self, and then God, an awareness of God. You know, I wasn't religious but I had an awareness of God because of a farmer. Boy, I mean, you plant the field and then go to pray. You know, you're looking for cows having calves and breeding is easy. <coughs> Getting the calf out, then I maybe mean, that's that's big money and that's a lot of deal. And boy, that's and so, you know, we knew about God, didn't know how to reach him, but I mean, we, we paid attention to God because he, but we didn't know how to, other than he did all this, we, we thought the rest of it was pretty much up to us to keep it running. So, but in Romans 1, 22 and 23, um, it, it says something interesting. It says, it said they knew God. They knew about God. And, and, and listen, this is really interesting because they lived in a culture of polytheism around them. The nation of Israel sat in the middle of a bunch of polytheistic people. We have no idea how fortunate we are in America. But when you look around, you look at Canada, you look at Mexico. And, and all of that's evangelism and missionary work. That. But we're enormous. I mean, we grew up with a, a monotheistic view of God. But I didn't know any more about it than anybody. I knew that. Uh, and then there's a conscience. There's a conscience. Uh, and you probably, out of all the apertures of soul, people probably talk about conscience more than anything. Don't you imagine? Because they have a guilty one. Or they have a clear one. Right? And, and uh, other people... They become guilt-ridden. You deal with them. They can't forgive themselves. They can't forget. They can't do this. They can't do that. I mean, a great deal of counseling as a pastor is with, with conscience. People with a conscience who have um, been burnt with it. To walk them out of that mess is uh, quite a task. And so... Um, there's a couple verses of it, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.12 and Romans 2. When you go to Romans 1 and then drop into Romans 2.14 and 15, you, I'm not going to talk about it because I think that's probably, of all the ap apertures, I think that one, conscience, everybody's more in line with it. I find it interesting, though. Um, 
in the, you might write this down and just look it up later. But in Genesis 20, I w the other day I happened to go through it and I was working on this subject too. And I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. Genesis 20 verses, um, let's say I wrote down five and six. Abimelech, you remember when, uh, when Abraham gave Sarah to Abimelech again, you know, gave it to Pharaoh in 12 and gave it to Abimelech. Thank God he, he quit doing that. But, you know, she's up in age and she must have really looked good for her age or else they were just starved to death for women. Uh, because, I mean, she's, you know, right? By the time we get to chapter 20, she's up in age. And uh, they're still, they're wanting to add her to the harem. Something's going on there. Well, anyhow, he brings this up. Abimelech brings this up, and he tells him, I'll tell you one thing, my conscience is clear. Hey, <laughs> I thought that was interesting. I mean, here's an unbeliever talking to two believers, <laughs> and he's got a clear conscience. I thought I'd put that in there for you. What we're after tonight is mentality. Mentality, that, that's going to be interesting, conscience and mentality. It has a left and a right lobe. The left lobe is called the mind, and the right lobe is called the heart, the cardia. The mind is called the noose in Greek. You're familiar with these words. Uh, and the mind is the, uh, and this is mentality, the mind, the mind of the left lobe, the left lobe of the mind is where perception is, and the right lobe is where comprehension is. And listen, this, the left lobe is where you learn categorical thinking of the Word of God, and over here is where you build your belief. This is where your belief is, and your faith center works there. That's the core. You know, the core operation of the core of the Word of God in your life is out of your heart, not your mind. It's out of your heart. That this is the the heart. This is the heart. That's that's the core of the watermelon. That's the core of the believer's life, right there. <coughs> and that's very important. I wrote down a couple Bible verses. Psalms thirty-three, fifteen says, <coughs> in reference to God, He who forms the heart of all is the one who considers everything they do. The one who forms the heart of all people, not just, but all of them, is the one who considers everything they do, because he knows the heart. I mean, the one that, listen to me, this is important. Now, one of the things that spiritual growth maturity will do to you will be able to allow you to look at yourself and at some point be content. You know, how, you know how wonderful that is? The sooner you learn to do that, the better off you are. I mean, so many people are so unhappy with their life. They're so discontent. This shouldn't be an issue if the word of God is flowing. And it, 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 it listen, you should be able, uh, well, we'll talk about it in a moment. You, he who forms the heart of all people is the one who considers everything they do. Then we have volition which is the, the will, the, you know, the free will of choice and emotion. The emotion is the appreciator, responder, nothing wrong with it as long as you keep it in the order. Notice I put it at the bottom of the heap. I didn't put it at the top, bottom. When you put it at the top, you, you're, you're a wreck. When you put it at the bottom, it, you keep it in its proper order. Uh, uh, Psalms 33, 21. This, I, don't, I don't think I put that on your paper. It says, in him, our heart rejoices. And that's the order it ought to be. In him, our heart rejoices. It don't matter what comes through your life. It's in him rejoicing comes. Psalms 33, 21. In him, in Christ, our heart rejoices. For we trust in his holy name. Don't care. Doesn't matter. 
and say, in the New Testament, we, we use the word rejoice a lot and the word joy. See? And one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is joy. How can you ever be without it? If you're without it, you're not, you're not operating under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Agreed? How can, how can, how can you be without joy? naturally gifted for you you can never run out of it because the Holy Spirit produces it you know the other day uh, a friend brought a, a friend into me and he, he was just so upset and I said to her how would you characterize how you feel now. Because you have to talk that way to them because you can't, they can't talk rational. How you feel right now. Tell me how you feel about yourself right now. It was, it was pitiful, right? I said, well, what would you, how would you like to be? And she told me, and I said, well, boy, is this your day? Is this your day? I'm going to give you something. You can take it with your coffee, and you can walk out of here well. She gave me that funny look like, you're selling dope. <laughs> but I'm going to give you something that you can have with your cup of coffee. You're going to walk out of here brand new and she looked at the friend that brought her like this is hokey baloney of course they never bring their Bible so I whipped my Bible out and I took her to Galatians 5 22 23 and just about everything that she wanted to be was right there on that paper. Want to be at peace. Want to have joy. I mean, it was all there. I said, how's it, how's it possible? And she was a believer. How's it possible that you're a believer and that's in your life and you're not taking it? You take this with a cup of coffee and you'll be well. Or a glass of water, or whatever. Matthew six twenty one have meaning to us now, for where your treasure is, your heart. That's your core. Your core, because let me tell you, your treasure really is where your core beliefs are. Wherever your core beliefs are is where your treasure is. It don't matter what you tell me. It's what you tell yourself. And here's one, Luke 2.19. Now, you'll remember this when I tell you. You don't probably remember Luke 2.19, of course. Mary, mother of Jesus, said, the scripture says, Mary treasured all these things, remember? Pondered them. Point number two. As we enter into point number two, I want you to write on your paper, because I know he didn't, because... <coughs> I wrote it on mine, so I could probably yours. Proverbs 27. This is what I was going to say earlier in my introduction. I left it alone. Proverbs 27, 19 says, and if you've ever, you ever been camping or been a hunter, been out around streams, you'll know this principle. As water reflects the face, So a man's heart reflects the man. Now think about that comparison. We've all probably looked at some point as a little kid fishing. I'd, I fished off decks at, you know, docks. And I'd look in there and I'd see my face, you know, the sun and everything reflecting. 
then my grandfather would say, if you can see your face, the fish won't bite. Of course, they weren't very deep in the water. But it's funny what you remember as a kid, isn't it? I don't know if that's true or not. I very seldom ever caught anything big enough to bring home any house. It didn't matter. As water reflects a face, so man's heart reflects the man. See, that's because there's where your core beliefs are. And that, that's what God is talking about. That's what Samuel's talking about. It's what the Lord is talking to Samuel about. <clears throat> now, it's because we, we talked about the soul. Now I want to talk about the heart. So we're going into mentality and we're going to the right lobe. Are you with me? We're boiling this. We're, we went into the soul, went into mentality, and I've raced it all away except the right to heart. Are you with me? Just talking about the heart now. The heart, and there may be more on this, but this is, this, this is about as most I give you tonight. The heart. It has five apertures that are important. This is really important for you to get this because this is where the core of your being is, is in your heart. <clears throat> and they're called tablets. The tablets of the heart. For example, in, second, in the Old Testament as well, the New. Um, in uh, second, I, on the top of the paper, in 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, that's what the law was written on, but on tablets of the human heart. Th this is not just a new, co a, a, this is a, a concept, a biblical concept. Now, these five things are based on what we read earlier in Psalms 33, 15. He who fashions the heart of all of them is he who understands how they work. And so it's really interesting when God reveals to us how the heart works in us. That's really interesting because there are a lot of things, you know, we go like, hmm. If God reveals it to you, it's important that you pay attention to how your heart works. Now, we're not talking about the heart that pumps blood, are we? We're talking about the heart that pumps ideas. Okay. Now, here are five things that are really important for you. Long and, long and short memory. Long, the, what we call the long and short memory uh, retention. Okay? Now, this is where you get the idea, the w w key words like remember. This is where that comes from. Remember, or like when we do the Eucharist. When we do the Eucharist, like in, um, like with the cup and that, like First Corinthians, First uh, uh, Corinthians eleven twenty five, uh, or twenty four twenty five, you know, in there where we do the bread and the cup. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Okay, uh, this is you know you when you put the, listen when when the Holy Spirit let me tell you something when the Holy Spirit puts the, when you allow him to cycle through the faith system and he puts the you know inhale exhale of the word of God this is how this works here when he puts it in you he has the ability to teach and recall it and how many times and this part of that memory center long and short memory center how many times are we out there and something comes up, and a flash, the Holy Spirit just goes like, pfft, he calls that scripture up, and there it is. And we're, we're, we're like third person watching this event, and you go like, how did that just happen? I, where did that come from? And that's where it came from. And we've all had that experience. Um, I mean, I, I have it quite a bit in teaching. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit will go like, ching, ching, and he, pfft, there he goes. And I go like, Why? You know, it'd been, it'd been nice if you could have given me a clue up. We've been working on this a couple of weeks here. 
And he goes like, nah, look, a little surprise is good for you. Um, but long and short, short uh, memory centers, they, that's part of that. It, it's part of retention. Uh, Philippians 1.3, I don't know if I wrote this on your paper, but just pay attention in the Bible to the word remember, remembrance. Paul says, I thank, I thank God in all my remembrance of you. You know, something will happen like when we get together as a family reunion with your cousins and things, and all of a sudden you get to talking with people, and holy macro, you, you drop back into, you were 12 years old someplace, and all that stuff, and all of a sudden you hadn't thought about that in all of these years, and all of a sudden it comes back like in technicolor. It was done in black and white, now it's like in color. It's the most amazing thing, isn't it? And you probably couldn't think that up in a million years if you were just trying to, but certain things can happen, and all of a sudden this whole thing triggers out. And that's because of the second thing, have a frame of reference. The fra frame of reference within the heart is an enormous thing. That's where categorical doctrine is processed, in the frame of reference. This is where what you teach is recalled. This, that, that's that computer center that stores all that stuff. It's just amazing to me. Um, no, I'm not the only person that has this. If you have a prayer life and you spend time with the Lord and get away from your cell phones and all that stuff and get alone with him, it is amazing. And you start praising him and you start just talking to him about stuff. It is amazing what he pulls up uh, to talk to you about right out of your own heart. Is that not amazing? We've all had this. I mean, we've all had this. We've had those times where we walked away and got silent with God and reached in our soul and pulled stuff, and it's amazing. It is an amazing time with him. And, and, and listen, you couldn't recall that three, four days later, you would like, because it was a glowing moment in your soul. I mean, it was, I mean, it was like the disciples when it says, uh, when, he, when he explained the scriptures, my heart burned within me. It's one of those moments, and two or three days later, it was, it was, so, it was so joyful. You try to recall it, and you can't recall it because you want that, you want that, that uh, spiritual high, and, you, and you, you, look, you want it, come on back and get it. No, it's not, it's, it's not leftover. It's got to come fresh, and, and, and many times you learn I hope you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I gave you a scripture, John 14, 26. Let me add one to it. Let me add one that's really important at this point. That's Proverbs 17, 22. Listen what, what the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, listen to what he said. He said, a cheerful heart is good medicine. I quoted that to this lady after I after she actually opened the Bible and took a sip of coffee. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries, listen, dries up the bones. You know what he did? He just said that the way your heart operates out of your core can affect your health. A broken spirit. A crushed spirit will cause you all kinds of medical problems. And the solution isn't to medicate. A cheerful heart is good medicine. A joyful heart. Good medicine. I'm going to tell you, I'm just giving you scriptures. I'm telling you, I use it a lot. This is stuff I use out there. I'm telling you, it works. Dr. Adema. You know, the spiritual doctor. Vocabulary. This word vocabulary has depth and meaning. Language, alphabet, words, communication. This is that whole center. You know, I have people. I'll say, well, why, why don't you come 
I mean, if you go to the church, why don't you come and study Greek with us? Oh, I could never do that. Of course you can. You know how I know, listen, you know how I know you could do that, how you could learn? Now you'd have to have a desire for it. You couldn't come in, well, you can't teach me. I can't, I can't teach a person like that. But let me tell you how I know you can learn the Greek language or the Hebrew language if you have a desire for it. I would recommend go to Greek first just because it's more relevant to your personal life. You know how I know you can do it? Because you can, sp you can communicate English. You know how, why you can communicate English? You learn the alphabet, words, and turn it into a language for communication. That's all any language is. You can learn any language you have a desire to use, not just to learn. But you have to have a desire to say, okay, I, th I would like to use it. I'd like to use the Greek language in my life. I think it would be beneficial to me. I'd like to learn it, to use it in class more. <clears throat> you know, when I went to, through my seminary training, I went through the languages, had no interest in them because nobody used them. Nobody in the church ever used them. I sat under R.B. Theme, who used them. I went back and took a refresher course. I'd been through two years of Greek and two years of Hebrew. Didn't pay any attention to it. I paid attention to it because I saw the need to use it. Went back to school and did refresher courses. I called up the professor and said, look, can I come back? I know I was a bad student, was there? Could I come back and just audit? They absolutely, Ron, come on back. I was a whole different kid in there. Because I wasn't a kid. A whole different guy in class. It wasn't after grade, I was after knowledge. It makes a whole difference when you're in class. <clears throat> vocabulary. It, it's vocabulary. And being able to expand that vocabulary. And you know what's interesting? It don't matter what you feel, engineering, I don't care what your other degree is in. The word of God is relevant to it, isn't it? Because it's a life principle. It don't matter what you do in life. The word of God is the doer of that life. That's why the word of God. Now, look, we're really fortunate. Because, listen, we really have good translations in the English. The King James, uh, New American Standard. We've got some great translations of the English. Uh, we're, we're enormously fortunate. There are a lot of translations out there in other languages that aren't worth a hoot. But ours is very good. But, um, and then there is the belief center, the core, the core beliefs. What you really believe, I call it core beliefs, what you really believe is in there. What you really believe, your beliefs, not what, this right here. And boy, listen, they should be hard to change. They are hard to change and should be. They are hard to change. The things that, the things that you are taught doctrinally and scripturally that become part of your belief system, and then all of a sudden you go like, hmm, they are very difficult to change and they should be. You shouldn't be able to just... And, and you know what's bad? You know what affects this today in our culture? What affects the heart more than anything in our culture? Drugs. Drugs. Boy, the devil couldn't beat us straight up. Because if it's a, if it's a war of words, we'll beat them every time. Because the word of God is the most powerful thing in this world. The word of God. So he, he goes around the thought process. If you've ever, ever dealt with anybody on drugs, you know what I'm talking about. He fights dirty. Listen, and the only way to get him back is to go to the Word of God. You will never win that war unless you get them on the word of God because it's the greater it's the greater of both.
you don't get them in the Word of God, they, at best they get reformed but never try. And they're always just one slip away. Every reform addict is just one, one drink away, one joint away, every away. And they know it. That's AA's. structure the word of God changes this whole structure it doesn't put doesn't numb you right drugs will go in there I mean this poor kid that just came home from North Korea you know this is what they've done to him these are bad bad people Core beliefs. This is where this is where old man cosmos diabolicus that we talk about. This is where the new man divine viewpoint. This is this is where this is the big deal. This is the big deal. Uh, listen, and let me show it to you. In Mark, circle this on your paper. I don't have time tonight to read it, but Mark seven twenty one through twenty three. You know, this is that great passage. Uh, out of the heart, out of the heart of men come evil think, comes evil thinking. And then he makes a list of a bunch of things. One of them is addiction. Out of the evil heart. Uh, Genesis 6, 5, there's another one. That deals with the flood. The generation of the flood. The generation of the flood. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart. That's, that's where this whole thing here has been maxed out with evil. Maxed out. I mean, it, every once in a while you meet a person like this. You never forget them. And you go like, whoo. I wouldn't be alone with this person ever in my life. Out of the heart. Here, here's, where, here's where inner dialogue, you need to pay attention to inner dialogue. Inner dialogue in the core beliefs of where you inner dialogue. And it says, do not say in your heart, and when your heart says things that is that is opposed to the word of God, that the truth of the word of God, you got to go. No, don't say in your heart. That's inner dialogue. What we call inner dialogue. Do not say in your heart. Or. And then spiritual IQ. This is this is the key for spiritual growth maturity, right there. That's in the heart. And and you can t you when your people you can be with people you can, you know a baby believer don't you? And listen, if if what they've learned they believe they'll they'll grow. And then you meet an immature believer. They're secured in their salvation, but they're wobbly about what a person has to do to be spiritual and and yada yada. You can meet those people, but listen. If they stay on course, they will become a mature believer. The point is, to me, is that when you see these people, it is because you're at a different level. You're not a peer. Right? I mean, you, you know, if you're a baby, then you're comfortable with baby believers. If you're an immature believer, you're not comfortable playing with them, but you are comfortable ministering to them. And so it goes up the ladder. And, and that's a reflection. That's spiritual IQ. That's spiritual IQ. And that's why um, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, he says that you ought to be teachers. You ought to be teachers. <clears throat> the immature can teach the babies. The mature can teach the immature and the babies. Super grace can teach them all and, 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 and more. Are you with me? That's what he's talking about. That's because you have spiritual IQ. 
You don't have a baby's IQ. You don't have immature. You have a mature. And what you're after is a super grace spiritual IQ. That's, that's, what, you're, that's what you're after. <clears throat> um, and so I gave you passages that deal with that. Psalms 44, 21, it says, He knows the secret of the heart. That's where they're kept. We all got them. We all have them. We talk to ourselves about them. Don't talk to other people because we're, we're un, maybe uncomfortable or they wouldn't be. Or it's none of the reason we keep. But we all right? secrets of our heart. We all have them. It's just part of part of your life. But you have to be careful in the inner dialogue how you deal with them. The inner dialogue how you deal with them. Make sure that you're always dealing with them with the Word of God. That you're always you're always screening them by the Word of God in your heart. This is what he's saying here when he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. What you see, see the eyes, what you see, what you understand, what you recognize, what you're dealing with is under enlightenment of the word of God. I pray that the eyes of your heart, what you are seeing within your structure, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling in you and what are the riches of the glory of the inheritances of the saints? See that? Always looking inwardly, but always screening it by the word of God. You understand? Very important. I mean, Paul was all over this subject matter, wasn't he? That I just quoted Ephesians 1.18. Um. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one. And listen, you know where that darkness is? It's either in the core of your heart or the light is. He says, for God who says, light shall shine out of darkness is the one has, who has shown in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I mean, when you get to the inner man, the face you should see is not yours. It's Christ. And if the only face you're seeing, then that's old man. Because the face you should be, you should be coming more accustomed with than your own is the Lord's. That's how you know how you're, you're progressing. When you're a baby believer, then it's your face most of the time. When you're a mature believer, it's the face of Christ because of the word of God. You know, as, as a man looks into the water and reflects. Okay. Under the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, and, I, and this is enormous, the word of God is able to judge the core beliefs of the inner man of the heart. Because what God is interested in is a, God, a man after his own heart. What God is after is doing the will of God from the heart. Remember, we saw that earlier. We saw that earlier. In Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. In second. In 2 Corinthians 1, 20, 1, 22, uh, 21 and 22, he says the Holy Spirit seals and pledges the heart. That's a guarantee that God is your father and, and he owns you lock, stock, and barrel. Nothing can come across 
nothing can happen to your life unless it, unless God signs off on it. And if he does, it applies to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Be well worth your time to write that down. In Romans 5, 5, we are told, at the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God into our heart. This is how we begin the Christian life. In Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 26 and 27, it talks about the Holy Spirit in our prayer life who is an intercessor who intercedes, intercedes by heart for the will of God. Is that not powerful? Holy catfish. Here is Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that Christ may dwell, that, that word dwell is the idea of home with, that Christ is at in residence and comfortable that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all that this is a goal, be able to comprehend with all the is the breadth, the length, the height, the to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up fullness of God. I mean, you can be full of a lot of things. And other people will tell you. But I'll tell you, the real goal in life through Jesus Christ is to be filled with the fullness of God. And that's attainable. You not get it from the world. You'll get it from this church, though. And then Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God. Now, I want to show you five things. And when I go through it, I want you to circle on your paper. And I wrote it so you could circle. Watch this now. I'm going to show you five things about the Word of God. Now, you know this passage, but the Word of God is living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of joint marrow, which is body, and able, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See those five things? You know what? That's the word of God at work in your soul. The word of God at work in your soul. When you, when you study the word of God and believe it, it becomes active. It becomes alive, active, sharper, piercing, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's the power of the word of God all the way to the core of your heart. There's very few things in this life that can touch the heart with that kind of power that the Word of God has. That's a promise from the, from the Bible. That's Hebrews 4.12. Those five, the Word of God has these five elements to it. That's the most powerful thing that you could possibly ever imagine for your life. Well, that's why Proverbs 4, 20 through 23 encourages us to learn the word of God and store it in our heart so that it can, you know, we take medicine and it, 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 they'll tell you, uh, this is, uh, you could help us, you're a pharmacist, slow active, that means that it, you can take, it releases over periods of time for you. This is how the word of God is. You put it in there, and it just works, works for you, works for you, works for you, works for you. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll close this session. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace, and we thank you for these who are, have come out on Wednesday night to study with us, both by automobile or foot, uh, walking distance, or by the Internet. We're thankful to have those people from around the world study with us. And we pray tonight, Father, that this study would not go void, but that we would learn to be believers that have a heart after God, a heart for God, 
a heart that beats one with God. And that comes through the study of the word and then applying that word, learning to live the word of God out in our life by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.